So I feel a bit of an imposter here tonight because there are some monumentally talented people, not just from uh, my past, people who are regarded really as my heroes, but also people who are practitioners today doing amazing work. Uh, and so that's kind of what we're going to talk a bit about today. Is copy something stuck in the past or is it relevant to the communications business today? I think I want to go back a second um, to my opening sentence because I think in that you can begin to see something of the chasm that exists between being a copywriter in the 1970s and a copywriter today in 2014. And what I said is that back in uh, the day, I was invited to write a copy test uh, which was critiqued by Edwin Brock. And Edwin was a poet. And when I say he was a poet, he's not like somebody who just wrote poems in a notebook. He wrote poems that went into books. He's got a penguin uh, dedicated to him. He was a real poet. If you Google, there are many ways to kill a man, it will give you one of Edwin's most famous poems. So he was a real writer. And actually, he wasn't the only one in Ogilvy when I started. I had the office next door to a guy called Salman Rushdie. And it always kind of tickled me that this guy who gave us this verbal explosion in Midnight's Children was also the copywriter who gave us Lover Bubble for Aero. Yeah. <laughs> Economy of words he hasn't adhered uh, to since. But in addition to that, Faye Weldon had been down the corridor uh, at one stage. And also, even before that, 40 years earlier, Faye, um, uh, Dorothy L. Sayers had uh, written Murder Must Advertise about the agency. So there was this kind of strange literary tradition to it. So that's the first thing that's interesting. The second thing is that I was invited to do a copy test. In other words, I was judged on the basis of a response to as I say, an O-level English exam. Behind it, the agency fully expected to train me. So the difference between then and now is now you have to go to art school or Watford in order to get a start in Adland because every single creative director is expecting you to walk around with a portfolio of work better than any of the shit they've ever done. You know, they expect you to turn up with DNAD award-winning work in your book when you're 24 years old. And what that means, of course, is that they're recruiting from a very narrow pool. Whereas when I started, there were some very, very peculiar people in advertising, I can tell you. You know, I came from being a truck driver in uh, Tooting, but George Ancatel had been a policeman in Zambia. Uh, David O'Connor Thompson was a gypsy. Uh, we, and he really was. He could play the fiddle just fantastically. So. Piers Crook was, uh, uh, was a toff who had completely failed at school. So oh, he was incredibly plummet, actually. It was marvellous. It was just marvellous. But there was this diversity inside the creative department. Um, and so uh, it was a really interesting time and a really interesting place. So a few weeks ago, I was at a creative social event, and uh, a, a young creative director came up to me, and he said, go on, tell me the truth. Was it better in the old days? Oh, so was it better? And, and what I said to her is, actually, you know, in some ways, in many ways, I'm afraid it was. And the reason it was better is all to do with money. You know, because in those days, what happened is that clients paid 17.65% uh, commission on the space they bought. They never paid the agencies. You got that money from the media owners. So you wrote a TV campaign, you wrote a press campaign, and the media owners gave you 17.65% uh, of the space costs. That's quite a lot of dosh, you know. And actually, if you're doing really good advertising, it means that a great TV campaign keeps running, a great press ad keeps running. So you're doing less work for more money. Way! You know. Then what happened was the recession of 1991. And what emerged from that is clients began negotiating with their agencies for fees. And from that moment, we were in the hell of timesheets, you know, and the rest of it. And clients not only started negotiating from 15% downwards, then they sent in procurement. And of course, Charles and Morris had completely fucked all of us because at that stage, <laughs> at that stage, uh, 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 until then, 
clients had thought the, their agency was a cottage industry. It was uh, inhabited by really interesting people who cared about their business. We were a bit eccentric. Uh, and we charged quite a lot of money, but by and large, we were worth it. We were creative. Then suddenly, they realized that actually Saatchi and Saatchi, as a PLC, was bigger than their own holding company. And so they sent in the procurement guys to beat us up, and they've done a pretty damn good job. In fact, they've beaten us up so successfully that now WH Smith is inviting agencies to pay money in order to be on their roster of considered agencies. So when people say to me, was it better in the old days, I go, yeah, because we have more money. And what more money means is we have more time. And maybe, I mean, the legends are of CDP that, you know, you get in 11 o'clock in the morning, you do two hours work, you go off to the pub and you wouldn't come back. Yeah, it's pretty much true. But mind you, when you were in the pub getting sloshed, you were still thinking about it. You know, I, I could give you legion of great campaigns that happened in the pub, you know, with people talking about it. And there was time. There was time to... Honestly, I looked at an old brief the other day. I couldn't believe it. You know, for a small one-off ad, you had two weeks. For a multi-media uh, campaign, you started at six weeks. That was in the creative department. The planners had six weeks to write the brief. So the thing about it is it was better because there was time. But in some ways, it was worse. And it was worse because you were a prisoner to media. So if you wrote a brilliant 37-second uh, commercial, tough ship, it was going to run as a 30. It just got ruthlessly edited. You know, the media owners told you exactly what size the space was. Uh, uh, and, of course, we got used to these rules. We u lived within these rules. But essentially, what we were doing was talking to a captive audience. You know, there were people sat in front of us of a night in front of the television, and they couldn't escape us. So, in some ways, I think that makes today so much better. You know, because what you're trying to do today as copywriters, as creatives and agencies, is capture attention. But attention from people who can blank you dead easily. They don't have to watch advertising, and in fact, they don't watch advertising. So how are you going to engage with them? For me, the big difference between then and now is that we wrote advertisements. Today, you guys are in the business of advertising, and they're definitely not the same thing. You know, in yesteryear, what you'd do is you'd write a carefully written argument with a beginning, a middle, and an end. And today, what's so incredible is that you can write a tweet and reach 600 million people, as Oreos did. Over a billion media pressions in total, they say. You can write, if that's my mum, can you tell her I'm, I'm going to be late tonight? <laughs> but, you know, you can write a, a video for Dove, a piece of branded content, and get 200 million views of it. You know, these are people, actually, who want to engage with your content and who want to share it. And that makes life today not only more difficult, but actually enormously more satisfying when you really crack it. Because not only that, technology allows you as creative people to do things that were impossible in yesteryear. So somewhere out in Holland, there is a copywriter who wrote what a little Philippine girl uh, said online in response to people talking to her. Her name was Sweetie, and she turned out to be an avatar, and she helped uh, Interpol track down over 100 paedophiles. Uh, who hopefully will get chucked into the slammer. Now, this started with a creative person having an idea, and it still required writing skills. And it's communication of an incredibly different kind to the sort that I was writing in yesteryear. Media has changed, and the demands of a changing media has meant that the demands on creative talent have changed as well. As well as writing copy, I dare say a hell of a lot of you in here are also writing code. And you have to, because it's where your target audience is going. You know, they're doing new, interesting things. If they're into apps, you've got to be into apps. You know, if they're going to go to websites, you've got to be there too. If they want to be on YouTube, you've got to be on YouTube. And all of these things require enormous skills. In yesteryear, as a copywriter, I wrote uh, press. Then I graduated to radio. Uh, and eventually, I was given uh, a poster brief. And then finally, I was allowed to have a crack at television. You know, today, the copywriter is writing all of the above, 
you know, plus direct mail. But on top of that, you've got email marketing, CRM marketing, you've got blogs, you've got vlogs, you've got uh, websites, you've got banners to write. In addition to which, there is this now enormous kind of category called branded content. And by the way, branded content isn't just the six-part webisode-driven series on YouTube. It is also your M&S, the most popular magazine in the UK, reaching four million women a week. And that is being written by copywriters. So there's a whole diversity of requirements today. And I think also the key thing and one of the things that we'll talk about after the film, I hope, is that the language has changed. You know, the language of yesteryear was literary. You know, I was surrounded by uh, uh, literary giants in the agency. You know, the newspapers we, we wrote for had millions of readers. Today, they're losing those readers. Today, the TV programs are losing their audiences. And what my children are doing is going online. And the language they talk is weird, I've got to tell you, you know. You all know that sick now means it's really, really good, you know. And uh, when I talk to my children about catacresis, they think I'm a cretin. You know, catacresis, I explain, is actually this trick of language where you use a word to mean the opposite of its meaning, like, that's really sick. Ugh, that's sick, Dad. They say, in this instance, meaning that I am sick. But, <laughs> OMG, lol. Do you know, WTF. You know, today's copywriter is, is actually talking the language of their audiences. You know, so in the film, you're going to see that my generation has got a few kind of uh, hiccups with some of the advertising they see today. And the reason for that is actually most advertising is aimed at millennials, not people like me at all. And the copywriters of you in here who understand that and speak that language, then the future is yours. What I would say about yesteryear and today is that in those old days, what we tried to do with a headline, a bit of wit, uh, and an argument was capture attention. You know, Howard down there captured attention for uh, Shell with a series of brilliant ads about what Shell were doing to the environment in a nice kind of way all that time back in the 1980s. People still remember them. In the film, you'll see Barbara Noakes. She wrote some brilliant ads uh, for Volkswagen in the 1980s. Tony Brignall wrote one of my favorite ads of all time. I still read it. It was for Parker Penn, and the headline was How to Write a Stinker. And it was all the advice you need to write somebody a really, really uh, uh, impressively rude letter. <laughs> you know, I'm currently dealing with BT. And boy, that letter has been handy. So that ad has been handy. But then at the same time, you know, today, I've been looking at some recent work. There's a guy called James Greening, and he wrote a series of tweets for uh, Tesco Mobile, which won the Grand Prix at the Daddy Awards a couple of weeks ago. There is not a little skill in those. They're brilliant, the way that actually he's been taking on the trolls with enormous kind of humor and fun. You know, I don't know if there's anyone here from uh, who's um, uh, seen the uh, um, Save the Children video, uh, A Second in a Year. Have you seen that? Yeah. That was written by a guy called, what's my note say? Yeah, Richard Beer. I mean, that's copy of the highest order, to write something like that, to plot it out. And then a guy called Marcus Isles, he wrote a letter in chocolate, on chocolate, a piece of uh, direct mail that had the most extraordinary response in research studies afterwards. It was sent to 5,000 marketers. 13,000 marketers said they'd received it. And that's what happens when you write a piece of copy that is so engaging. You create an experience that people want to be part of. So there are, before we watch the film, I just want to say that for me, there has never been a more exciting time to be in advertising. I really, really envy people who are at the beginning of their careers because you do seem to me to have so much choice, so much, uh, 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 such a, a, a kind of platform on which to be able to strut your stuff. You know, for me, the future is absolutely magnificently golden if you are able to understand people, if you understand ideas, and if the ideas you have are branded, relevant, and memorable, then you will have a fantastic life. 
Now, we're here for three things, I think. The first is to see the movie. It's not very long, but I hope it will also lead you into the second reason why I hope you're here tonight, which is that afterwards, I would really, really like you all to join in the debate. Is copy dead, as Tony Brignall says, you know, rather sadly, or is it simply dormant? And that's the third thing I would uh, hope that you're here to do, which is the copywriters among you to do the census, to go to the DIMA website, fill in the census, because it'll give us a picture of actually what the state of this particular craft skill is like uh, and be able to address the balance so that copywriters you know, can once again shine as they did in the day of Brignall and Fletcher. <laughs>